What do a wrecking crane, Creole food, and this new micro market have in common? Find out next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. On this episode of Columbus Neighborhoods, what we preserve and how we do it. From buildings to culture to a community's sense of purpose. Hi, I'm Javier Sanchez. And I'm Charlene Brown. Back in the day, Columbus was on the front lines of historic preservation with lessons learned from both German Village and Union Station. And to honor the 50th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act, our first story takes a look at how the whole movement got started. When we see historic architecture, we might enjoy it, we might appreciate it. What we as preservationists would ask people to think about is the people who built it. Back in the 1850s, there was a, a southern lady who was traveling up the Potomac River, and she happened to see George Washington's Mount Vernon house, and it was in disrepair by this point. And she was so disappointed and shocked by that that she went back down south and rallied some ladies to save George Washington's home. Because if you, you know, don't save our, our first president's home, really, that's just a stain on our country. That was one of the very earliest preservation efforts. The historic preservation movement had focused mainly on national monuments. It was linked very much throughout the 20th century to the preservation of national treasures like the national parks. In the case of Ohio, the homes of our presidents, the very significant earthworks and mounds. In 1963, German Village was recognized as a historic district within the city of Columbus. The German Village Society, the German Village Commission were created and instituted local architectural review. What is remarkable about it is it was a neighborhood of vernacular buildings. It was basically a working class neighborhood. It had the setting with the brick streets and the iron fences and the little yards, but that was not the norm at that time. Normally what communities were preserving were the homes of the rich and famous, their cultural institutions, their major buildings like a courthouse or a state capitol. The preservation effort of the 1960s really emerged as a reaction to urban renewal efforts and transportation and interstate building. There was a lot of damage done to a lot of historic neighborhoods and cities and communities. Vast swaths of American cities were torn down without any thought whatsoever of what was in the way. It really led to the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. So there were thousands and thousands of buildings that were lost, some significant, some probably not. But there was no way to evaluate what was important, what wasn't important, how do we preserve, how do we move forward without necessarily just wiping out the past. The 1966 National Historic Preservation Act made preservation a national priority and put preservation in the hands of the states. States developed the program in which they would execute the requirements of the federal law. 
And in Ohio, the natural location for the State Historic Preservation Office was the Ohio Historical Society. Their main thrust was to get out there and identify the historic sites, survey historic properties, list historic properties and sites in the National Register of Historic Places. So it gave local people more control. It gave local officials a way to evaluate what was significant. And it really put the focus on what happens at the local level with these tools at the national level. But the fact is preservation is local. One of the great losses in the city of Columbus to this day is Union Station. The fact that that building was torn down in 1976, designed by Daniel Burnham, one of the most important architects in American history. Not only did we lose a piece of our history, we actually lost federal funding. And that's a part of the story people don't necessarily know about. The city was applying for money for transportation, for a transportation center at this new convention center. They tore down Union Station, didn't go through the appropriate review process to say, is this a historic building? How can we save it? How could we incorporate it in the design? And they were disqualified for funding, which became a national case. There were editorials in cities well outside of Ohio saying, learn from Columbus, Ohio. We need to respect our historic properties as we move forward in the future. What happened out of Union Station? A couple of things. One is the Columbus Landmarks Foundation was formed and became an advocate for historic preservation in the city. In 1976, that same year, Congress passed the Tax Reform Act that provided some tax incentives, not the incentives that we have available today, but it was the first time there were tax incentives for the rehabilitation of historic properties. And it saved the second Daniel Burnham building in Columbus, the Wyandotte Building. That law had a direct impact on the preservation of that building, I have no doubt. People believe that listing a property in the National Register means that that property will never be able to be demolished, and that's just not the case. The National Register listing tells a property owner, tells others, that you have a property that is worthy of preservation because of its significance in history and architecture and our culture. You know, one thing that we preservationists don't do is we don't preserve everything just for the sake of preservation. We want to make good decisions. We realize that there needs to be a balance between infrastructure improvement, development, public works, and what we try to help do is to find a balance. So we play a role in helping federal agencies and communities make good decisions and what they should preserve. It's really about property owners or neighborhood associations deciding to band together and say, this is important to us. The longer you can keep saving things and fighting for them and preserving them, the better off you are. I think it reflects that when you drive through German Village in Old Town and King Lincoln and Victorian Village. There's really an active preservation movement in Columbus. And what I'm happiest about, it's engaging young professionals, architects, planners, people who want to live in a city that's interesting and dynamic and diverse. I won't be around to watch the next 50 years, but I'm really hoping that the young generation pick up the mantle and they make it theirs and they do it their way. And I'm sure it will be for the good of everybody. Jeff Darby was one of the original activists who helped preserve the Union Station Arch. And we're going to see a lot of him throughout the year as he takes us to buildings that are rich in significance but may go unnoticed. Jeff's first assignment, to revisit the majestic Union Station and tell us why it was worth saving. Columbus Union Station was one of the most iconic and most recognized buildings in our architectural history. And people were really sad when first the arcade in 1976 and then the station itself 1977 were torn down for the new convention center. But it turned out that some of the arcade actually survived and there's a piece right over here in my backyard. This lion's head was part of a cornice that was an, an upper part of the um, arch that's now preserved in the uh, arena district. You can still can see where the tracks are and get an idea of what the area looked like a long time ago. Why don't we go there? The first Union Station was built in 1850. 
uh, at a location at the northeast corner of what now is North High Street and Nationwide Boulevard. The coming of the railroad really was something for, for Americans generally and certainly for Columbus. Uh, there was a lot of excitement about this new form of transportation. We're at the convention center now, but I want to take you over to High Street and show you where the entrance arcade to Union Station was to give you a feel for what the area was like. So where we're standing right now is uh, where you entered the property. And if you look, you can still see the tracks down below. Uh, the trains still go through here. There are no passenger trains, not since 1979. It's hard to tell right now, uh, but this was the center of commercial and travel activity for Columbus in the 19th and most of the 20th centuries. Uh, this is where people arrived at the city. Uh, this is where they left from the city. Uh, they saw loved ones off to war. They saw people come back from war. It was the gateway for the community. Now I want to take you to see some architecture that was inspired by Union Station. Um, we aren't entirely without Union Station. It still lives in a certain form and it's worth seeing. And it's the I-670 cap that's the entrance to the short north. People sitting there having dinner or having coffee don't even know they're sitting on a bridge over a busy freeway. At the time, the Union Station Arcade was demolished in 1976, uh, but because the arcade was listed in the National Register of Historic Places when the demolition began, there actually was a lawsuit filed to stop the demolition, and it was in fact stopped. And that gave uh, enough time for a small group called Citizens for the Union Station Arch to form with the purpose of preserving the remaining arch. At the time the demolition was stopped, uh, the arch was about all that was left. So it was quite an adventure for a bunch of amateur preservationists who didn't exactly know what we were doing. In 1999, to allow for expansion of a parking garage, the arch made its second move uh, and was moved to the center of the arena district and it's now a real, uh, a real feature of the district. At the time our little group was doing this, I don't think we had any idea of what the effect could be. So this is the arch uh, here in the center of the arena district. And so you get a sense of how monumental this really was and what a gateway for the city it was. The demolition of Union Station led directly to creation of the Columbus Landmarks Foundation. But I think generally because so many people remember Union Station, they're sorry that it's gone, they wish it hadn't been torn down. I think Columbus has been more sensitized to the, the whole issue of preserving our historic heritage. You can see here and there, there are pieces missing or damaged where the demolition did do some damage. Um, but really, considering that it's, it stood for 100 years and has been moved twice, it's not, yeah, not in bad shape. The, uh, the process of reassembling it was very interesting. It took a long time to raise the funds, this little group of about 12 people. Uh, the, the pieces were taken apart from the original arch. They were numbered very carefully according to a plan. They were stored just long enough for all the numbers to wash off, so when it was time to put it back together, we weren't exactly sure how to do it. <laughs> Uh, it was really a, a remarkable uh, undertaking with a lot of donated help. Land from the electric company, Recreation of Parks agreeing to take care of it, um, mortar and sand from Columbus Coal and Lime, uh, donated architectural services, trucking services donated, the storage was donated. And the city of Columbus, perhaps to make amends, uh, did provide uh, some cash subsidy to help pay some of the bills uh, and got a very good piece of art as a result. It really is an important part of our past, and I for one am very glad it's still with us. The upside to preservation is the protection of landmarks that we treasure. But what happens when a neighborhood doesn't have the money or the contacts to restore anything? We sent Charlene to the east side to do some digging. I'm on the east side at Creole Kitchen, and this is where I'm meeting Kathy Nelson for lunch. She's a retired educator, local historian, oh, and yes. preservation activist. Yes, yes. And Kathy, your family is from somewhere right around in this area, right? Oh, absolutely. I grew up on the near east side. Uh, my grandparents lived at 1611 Pembroke Avenue, which is right on the other side of Pilgrim Elementary School, if you know where that is. Yes, I do. And my great-grandmother actually lived in Poindexter Village at uh, uh, Market Street, apartment 1A. Oh, get out. Yes. Kathy is one of the members of the Columbus Landmarks Foundation, and she's part of a team that's charged with identifying buildings in the African-American community for preservation. 
Okay, this food looks so fantastic. We have just got to talk about this a little bit. Now, I'm excited about these gator bites. I'm dying to try that one with the shrimp. Creole Kitchen is located in a little strip mall on Mount Vernon Avenue. Chef Henry Butcher is a Louisiana native. His crawfish etouffee has been called a masterpiece with a rich roux and seafood sauce. We've got jambalaya too, that bayou version of the Spanish paella. Mm. You know, one thing, having food like this makes you think of home, you know, a different time, a different place, family. You know, I'm sure we're gonna remember these tastes for quite some time. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> but yes, it's those tastes, those smells, it's the feelings, the emotions, you know, the passions, the memories, the very memories of uh, those of us who grew up on this east side have plenty of. One of the problems that I see is that for the African American community, preservation is really, I don't know whether to say it's not as much of a priority or simply that it is not done as much as in the community at large. What, what, how would you, how do you see it? I see this community being under siege as it comes to, to preservation. In many areas in the Near East Side, um, the people who live there oftentimes don't have the means to preserve anything. I mean, they're so busy trying to preserve day to day. And, when you, and, and preservation costs money. When you're trying to save any type of old building uh, because it's the icon in the neighborhood, it's very difficult because if you don't have the means or you don't have the connections, oftentimes that structure is disposable and it's always taken down or many times it's taken down. Well, and we have an example of that right now with Poindexter Village. Oh, yes, we do. Poindexter Village troubles me because it has gotten a bad rap over the years. What is in people's immediate memory of Poindexter is negative because it became very low income. And unfortunately, we have lost Poindexter Village. We're only down to two buildings left. And it's my great hope that those two buildings are saved. But that brings up the question then, um, especially for African Americans, who makes the decisions? And the fact that we're not even aware of the discussion when it comes time to make the decisions. Well, you're right about that. Many times we're not at, at the table. And quite honestly, I'm sad that our, our city leaders have not given more attention to this great neighborhood. Part of what you do is find places in the African American community for preservation. It's called the African American Landmark Initiative, and that was the whole piece was to walk the neighborhoods, look at the historic buildings that are still standing. Some of them are not in too good of shape, but they are still sturdy, they're still standing. Somehow a change needs to happen so that more of our history gets preserved in our neighborhoods, but how do you make that happen? What has to change? You have to get out in your neighborhood, walk in your neighborhood, take your children in your neighborhood and point out those historic icons. It may not be a fancy building, but maybe it's just a little old market that's been standing there for 82 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so once we start taking our children out, helping them understand where they live, and why where they live is important and building that sense of place, that sense of home. As they grow, they will grow into a love of preservation and they will not be so willing, that next generation will not be so willing to see their historic icons in their neighborhoods be torn down. At my lunch with Kathy Nelson, one thing was really clear. Preserving buildings cements a feeling of identity among neighbors and within a community. And it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all in every neighborhood. On the south side, preservation efforts are evolving, and it starts with the simple things like fresh produce. When you see 22.5% unemployment, 
One in four houses are boarded up. 68% of the people in this neighborhood live in poverty. I mean, that's devastating. So there was a rallying cry from the mayor and um, many of us said, it's time we stand up. It was business leaders in the area, nonprofit leaders, faith leaders, community members saying, what can we do? That's when we decided we had to go deep and that meant servicing the entire family in a, in a very different comprehensive way. The first smart thing we did that doesn't always happen is why don't we ask the residents what do they need versus what do we think they need. Um, so we sent out 2,700 surveys. And those five things that came out of there was safe housing, health, education, jobs, and safety. You could say, what do you tackle first? Or you could say, how do we bring everybody together to do it all? No one city can do this alone. No one philanthropist or generous family can do that alone. And no one nonprofit can do it alone. It's a wonderful example of public-private partnership. That's when the city said, we have safety. The other thing was the John Maloney Health Center was built for health. And then there's six different partners working on housing in this neighborhood. So Tani and I and our board decided that our mission is going to be education and then we're going to help people get jobs. At about the same time, this building, which had been sitting vacant for five years, the mayor said, here, here's 67,000 square feet. Figure out what to do with it. The building uh, was 1904, the original building that we're sitting in. It was an elementary school from when it was founded until it closed in 2006. And then it was a swing school from 06 to 09. There were additions put on in the 1920s and then additions in the 1960s. So it's this huge building, it's a magnificent building that's vacant. There'd be all this investment and Reeb would be vacant, it would become blight, and it would be a detriment to the neighborhood rather than a catalyst. So it was Don Kelly and Mayor Coleman who were saying, if we don't do Reeb, who will? What we wanted to do was respect the building and keep the architectural integrity of the building. Every classroom we wanted to maintain as a classroom, there's still slate chalkboards. And it's funny because actually I have kids come in nowadays, they're like, what is that chalkboard? Where's my smart board? So we had the city, we had the private donors, but then the third part of that was the nonprofit community. I mean, we had nonprofits coming to us saying, we need to be down here. For example, Boys and Girls Club. We need to have a club on the south side. They took the upper floor. And then we had Godman Guild and St. Stephen's and Alvis, Digital Works. And as of two years ago, we were full. So we have 14 different nonprofits housed in this building. Really, until you come here, it's hard to imagine what that means. What does that look like? The Southside Learning and Development Center has eight classrooms, and they serve infants from six weeks old, the little itty bitty babies, up to five or six years old when they go off to kindergarten. We have one entire floor dedicated just to the adult learner. On the third floor, we have Boys and Girls Club. They serve students from six years of age to 19 years of age, and they service over 300 kids. The lower level, the garden level of the building, is the theme is community connection. And one way to bring people together is when we break bread. So half of the garden level is about food. Mid Ohio Food Bank runs the cafe and a market. And the cafe is pay what you can, the market is also pay what you can. And what we love is that all these tenants are working together. A mom can drop her child off at the Learning Center and go to Digital Works for job training and her older child after school could be in the Boys and Girls Club. That was the dream and that's happening. The proof in the pudding is how are we changing the prosperity in this neighborhood. I can go upstairs to the Boys and Girls Club and see the boys and girls that have opportunities. The young men that are from the Juvenile Correction Institute that are working in our cafe that come every day, they have hope that when they're released, they have a job to go to. They have something to go to versus running from. I watch our neighbors come in these doors and I am so blown away by their dedication and their resolve to get through these barriers. This neighborhood is gonna come back and it's gonna be a thriving neighborhood. Mostly because we have people in this neighborhood that care. I truly believe abundance can only be created in community. And what the 
Cranes, the Grodys, and the Kellys did more than the checks that they wrote. They created community. That's what it really takes, and that's why this building is going to be around for generations to come. That's our show, so thanks for watching. And remember, we're preserving all of our shows on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org, so log on if you want to see these and other episodes. See our stories on the WLSU mobile app, plus you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.